Okay. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to the second day of the technical sessions at the ISS Research and Development Conference 2020. Uh, we all wish we could be somewhere in person, uh, but obvious things have prevented that. So we're very happy that you could all join us here online. Uh, so we've got a great day in store for you. Um, but first, I wanted to tell you a little bit about the American Astronautical Society. AAS is a nonprofit technical society founded back in 1954. Our mission is to advance all space science and exploration activities. We do that through our well-known symposia like the Goddard Symposium, the Glenn Symposium, and the Von Braun Symposium, which is coming up October 26 through 28. We also have some amazing technical conferences like our Astrodynamics Specialist Conference, our Spaceflight Mechanics Meeting, and our Guidance, Navigation, and Control Conference. You can find out about all of our symposia and technical conferences on our website at astronautical.org. And we also partner with the folks at ISS National Labs, or CASIS, on this conference. And we at AAS lead the effort on these technical sessions. So we hope you enjoy them. Um, so for information about today, uh, tomorrow, uh, and the last day of plenary sessions in October, visit issconference.org slash agenda. And now I'd like to thank our sponsors without whom this event couldn't happen. Uh, first off, our platinum sponsor, uh, the Boeing Company. Thank you very much to Boeing. Uh, you've been with us for uh, since the beginning and we truly, truly appreciate it. Uh, and then our silver sponsors for this year, Jacobs, KBR, Lidos, and Oceaneering, Teledyne Brown Engineering, and the Engineering and Innovative Technology Development Organization at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Be sure to follow us and uh, the, be sure to follow AAS and the ISS National Labs teams online using the social media accounts you see here. And uh, here is today's agenda. So we are going to have three morning sessions on international utilization, biological research and human health. And then midday, we're going to go into poster presentations. Uh, each will be 10 minutes followed by a it, which consists of a five minute recorded presentation followed by five minute Q&A period with the poster's author. Some really amazing topics uh, are covered here. So we strongly encourage you to take some of these in if you can. Uh, those conclude at 2120 Universal or 1720 Eastern. And then we'll break until 2300 Universal, 1900 Eastern or 7 p.m. Eastern when we'll have two more sessions with a focus on the activities and capabilities from our friends at JAXA. Okay, so a little housekeeping. How to ask questions. Down the bottom of your window, you have a little thing that says Q&A. Uh, that is the place where you ask questions of any presenter. So enter your questions there. Please do not enter them in the chat. The presenters will not see them there. And then the times. So uh, all times shown are in universal uh, time or Zulu time. Um, conversion, it's minus four hours for Eastern time, minus five hours for Central time, and plus nine for Japanese standard time. With that, let's get started. Our first session today is on international ISS utilization. Our session chair is none other none other than Alan DeLuna, the Executive Vice President of the American Astronautical Society Board. And he is also the individual pretty much solely responsible for putting together these technical sessions each year. And so we uh, really appreciate Alan's uh, contributions uh, to this event and making it such a success. All right, so this session includes six presentations. They're listed there on your agenda in front of you now. And I'll give you a second to take a quick look at those. We got some really cool stuff. I'm looking forward to hearing about the JAMS commercial service. And uh, with that, let's get started. Uh, we'll be running our, our 
uh, presentations all in a row. Uh, they're uh, automatic and automatically advance with narration. And uh, after those are finished, we will come back here for the Q&A session. So without further ado, let's get started with the presentations. Hello, everyone. I'm Sandeep Bhattala, co-founder at Qualivan Technologies Private Limited, incubated at IIIT Hyderabad, supported by Hexen Online Accelerator and fellowship grant by Nidhi EIR. We are very excited to share our research nanophotonics-based VOC monitoring sensor at mid-IR inside International Space Station with you. So let's begin. The journey of air quality monitoring inside ISS begins with ANITA, which stands for Analyzing Interferometer for Ambient Air. And it was the first proposed air quality monitoring device inside International Space Station, which was launched in August 2007. The lessons learned from ANITA 1 will be rectified in ANITA 2 mission. These will be fitted inside the express rack of US Destiny, as you can see from the second image. Coming to the specifications, they can analyze up to 32 trace gases, and can take readings every five minutes and updates the background spectra every 12 hours. It has also the capability of detecting outliner gases. The main findings of ANITA-1 are ammonia, PFP stands for perfluoropropane and SF6. Even though there are few challenges persists like requirement of compact solution, even some FDR spectra exhibits measurement noise, baseline drift and optical saturation problems. Spectral features of high absorbing gas like H2O, CO2 overlaps, thus requires robust calibration methods in ANITA 2, which increase its costs. Also needs on-chip measurements, and it requires low-pressure gas cell measurements that results in wear and tear of gas pumps and cells. And now our approach is to use nanophotonics, which reduces bulky optical elements and can perform multi-gas measurements like FDIR, but on the chip with less power consumption and with auto tuning of refractive index, thus reducing the spectral overlaps. The use of micro rings as sensors increases the time of interaction at micrometers level with enhanced sensitivities when cascaded. We are using group four materials for mid infrared sensing with the benefits of standard CMOS facility fabrication, and there will be no low pressure measurements as well. Our design approach is to use cascaded micro rings by placing the radius of reference ring greater than the sensing ring inside the gas cells. Each cascaded resonator resonates at different and fixed wavelengths of incoming broadband light source to achieve the vernier spectrum. Alternatively, one can use PDMS as a selective layer for allowing a selective molecules onto the sensing ring. For validation purpose, we are only sticking to one unit cell of ready 90 micrometers for sensing ring and 100 micrometers for the reference ring. We obtained the vernier spectrum peaks at 3315 nanometers. This is the wavelength at which ethanol shows the strong absorption. We simulated the presence of analyte by using the optical modulator measured element as well as optical attenuator available in numerical interconnect software as shown in the graph that the spectrum shifts with reduced power attenuation. It is desired that the maximum of envelope is overlapped with major absorption fingerprint so that the significant transmission drop in the spectra can be absorbed. But the changes in the temperature often results in the variation of radius and thus the wavelength of maximum envelope. So we need a tuning circuit to mitigate these issues. So we write a code in the script file to do so. As of next steps, we are planning to do outliner gas detection with self calibration techniques. We want to test the entire sensor for gas analysis. We want to implement the thermal tuning circuitry instead of script file. Finally, we would like to integrate all the electronics sources and monitors for fabricating the sensor. Thank you very much. Come join us at our presentation Space Missions on the Bartolomeo Platform at this year's ISS Research and Development Conference. I am Christian Steimler from Airbus Defense and Space in Bremen, Germany. 
I give this presentation together with our co-authors Bill Corley from Airbus DS Space Systems Incorporated, Espen Tronson from the University of Oslo and Mark Lepena from On-Off Block Synesis. We are all excited to tell you all about our new external payload hosting platform on the International Space Station, BART. Bartolomeo was launched successfully on board the SpaceX 20 flight earlier this year and has been installed to the ISS Columbus module. With the last step, the cable installation done by the ISS crew very soon, the platform will be ready for utilization by the end of January 2021. In our presentation, we will present the first payload missions under contract by the Bartolomeo service, the Norwegian Multi-Needle Langwehr Probe, and the Xenop laser communication terminal from the United States. These two first missions are excellent examples of Bartolomeo's value among the external platforms on the ISS. With Bartolomeo, we start to offer an all-in-one space mission service to the market. In cooperation with our partners, the European Space Agency and the ISS National Lab we make space available for every commercial and institutional customer from Europe, the United States and worldwide. The service includes launch opportunities on all pressurized visiting vehicles to the International Space Station. Upon reaching ISS, the payloads are installed using the Kibo or Nanorex airlock and robotic arm. After successful commissioning, Airbus supports payload operations with a cloud-based console privately accessible for each customer and cloud-based data delivery with full data privacy protection. After the end of the mission, payloads may be returned back to Earth. This service has a turnaround cycle of two to three years. One to two years are required for mission preparation. The standard mission duration is one year and can be extended as required. Learn more about Bartholomew. Hi, I'm Chloe, a fourth year medical student at King's College London. And I'm Lauren, also a fourth year medic at King's. We have worked with ISET over the past few years as mentors on their Mission Discovery Initiative and were fortunate to be given the opportunity to develop student experiments studying polythene degradation by the greater waxworm Galleria melanella. Today we will be discussing this experiment and its value in STEM outreach. The International Space School Education Trust, ICIT, is a UK registered charity established in 1998 which utilises space as a platform for STEM engagement aimed at school-aged children. They organise week-long programmes called Mission Discovery across the globe. The initiative consists of talks from scientific experts and NASA astronauts on various space and STEM-related topics, alongside interactive group activities where teams of students meet, undergo team-building exercises and partake in experiment and hypothesis design. At the end of the week, one group's hypothesis and theoretical experiment design is chosen as a winner and that experiment is developed and launched to the International Space The hypothesis for this specific experiment was conceived by a team of school students in Ajmer, India, at the mission discovery held there in 2018. The team focused on polythene plastic and a study that found that Galleria melanella larvae could digest a polythene grocery bag. However, the study found that this metabolism occurred at a rate of 0.077 mg per worm per hour, which meant that studies into optimization of conditions for increased rate were necessary. The team wanted to study how the degradation of polythene by the greater waxworm might be influenced by the spaceflight environment. The method of the experiment itself involved placing four waxworms into a polythene envelope with pinprick holes to allow air into the pocket. The envelope was heat sealed along all the edges and fitted to the shape of the tissue culture flask in which it was placed. After taking the experiment out from the refrigeration where it had been stored for transport, astronaut interactions occurred at 3, 7 and 14 days to take photos of the plastic pocket and observe any holes made. We worked on the initial stability experiments and development in the lab at King's College London in March of this year, we did the final setup at the Space Station Processing Facility at Kennedy Space Center in Florida, and the experiment was launched aboard SpaceX CRS-20. ISET runs a winner's Facebook group, 
a private forum on which mentors can post the developments associated with winning experiments for the teams to keep up to date. This was our main method of communicating about the experiment. The continued engagement with the students responsible for the hypotheses was a great motivator. It's also been found to be beneficial for the student teams as they gain insight into the experimental development process, which can be useful for future STEM careers. We plan to use our experience to inform future STEM mentorship. We both enjoy mentoring students and believe that the element of competition is a great motivator for school-aged children. Using our knowledge of the process of experiment design and development from start to finish, we can aid the teams in formulating an informed, feasible and well-planned hypothesis for future experiments whilst championing innovation. Social media generally presents a fantastic tool for science communication purely because of the global reach of content. We were both actively tweeting and sharing our progress during our time at the Space Station Processing Facility and following the launch, this experiment was featured on the official ISS Research Twitter account with a reach of nearly 900,000 followers. While our experiment specifically has been a useful facilitator for science communication and STEM outreach, the ISS presents an ideal platform for STEM education on all levels. Astronauts are responsible for generating educational content for outreach purposes, which can be aimed at any audience from school children through to scientific experts. Programmes such as Mission Discovery are a chance for students to meet and network with professionals and university students, while the sheer variety of experiments performed on the ISS, from fluid dynamics to human physiology, mean that regardless of someone's field of interest, there is material available to further understanding. We owe our thanks to the teams at ISIT, Nanorax and Kings Close London for their support throughout the whole experience. Everyone, my name is Hamda Shihi. I'm a space technology senior researcher at the UAE Space Agency. I'm the lead of Test and Orbit Program and in these slides, I will be presenting a summary of Test and Orbit Program. The UAE Space Agency is a federal government entity that was established to bring together the space sector under one umbrella and also to help develop and coordinate the sector by developing a regulatory framework, developing a space policy strategy which aim at developing human capital and enabling and supporting R&D in the field of space science and technology. So um, the UAE has been active in space for a short time and as we can see here some examples of the national developments uh, such as the Emirates Mars mission that is Hopper probe that was launched to Mars uh, in July of this year, Mars 2117 which is long-term program um, about uh, uh, building a settlement on Mars uh, in the year 2117 and the human space flight program. In line with the strategic objectives of the UAE Space Agency in promoting and supporting scientific research in the field of space science and technology through direct investments and support to R&D projects in collaboration with academic institutions and the research centers in the UAE, the Space Missions Directory developed and launched the Science, Technology and Innovation Roadmap, in which a major component of the roadmap is life and physical science, which was uh, implemented through conducting microgravity research in this domain. Uh, so the agency participated and launched a number of initiatives in this domain, starting with Genes in Space in collaboration with Boeing and the National in 2016, and uh, that was followed in orbit. Tests in orbit was carried out in collaboration with local and international partners. It basically aims at inviting researchers and the students in the UAE to design and develop nano experiments focused on multiple disciplines of life science like biology and plant science to be launched and tested um, at the International Space Station. The competition consists of a number of stages, as, as we can see in the timeline. Um, as a first step, it was kicked off with marketing campaign through competition setup and launch to introduce the competition to the students. And then we had um, finalists and winner selection 
and then we moved to the payload design and development to finally um, launch the experiment to the ISS, which is scheduled to be in quarter four of 2020, as well as um, quarter two of 2021. I will provide you with a glimpse on, on the winning experiments that was developed by uh, university students. The first experiment is CHIME and it's about characterizing human immune deficiency in microgravity environment. It basically aims at analyzing one pathway of immune cell differentiation, specifically the differentiation of monocytes into macrophages, which are a key component of maintaining a strong immune system. The second experiment was about space food for bone health. It was about testing nutritional sensory and microbial properties before and after travel to space of a proposed space food that is camel milk based and dates flavored smoothie fortified with vitamin D and dehydrated. We also had another experiment that was also as part of the scientific mission of astronaut Haza al Mansouri. It was uh, the palmetry growth experiment um, and it aims at studying the germination of palmetry in microgravity by understanding the morphogenetic changes that affects the seeds in space. Another initiative that I would also like to highlight is learning from the UAE astronaut Haza al Mansouri which was about the palm oil emulsification experiment. This experiment aims at studying the behavior of an emulsion of two fluids, palm oil and colored water, in microgravity um, on the ISS and on, on Earth. And through this initiative, we allowed the students to conduct the same experiment using um, an experiment kit uh, with replicate materials to help them assess the impact of microgravity on fluid properties. of ISS remote sensing data in new media to further our project is trying to bring remote sensing from the ISS into school lessons but why are we doing that well STEM that is science technology engineering and mathematics are not particularly popular among German students however astronaut is still a dream job to many of them and it has a lot to do with the view on earth from space which you can also get from remote sensing Remote sensing encompasses all of STEM. Math, physics, and computer science are necessary to bring satellites like the space station into orbit, take digital pictures, and process them. Analysis leads to results in geography, biology, and chemistry. And that's just the school subjects. Beyond that, many soft skills are fostered that will turn the students into responsible, scientifically literate of the many Earth observation and imaging technology experiments on the largest Earth observation satellite ever to have existed, right now only very few are available for free online. The main experiment to draw Earth observation data from was, was the HDEV experiment that streamed the view from the ISS on Earth constantly for about five years. We have archived all video materials sent by HDEV and enhanced many highlight flyovers with atmospheric correction maps and text and implemented some of them into school lesson material. Additional ISS EO sensors with different capabilities are used as well. For example, the Japanese Meteor Project that takes nighttime videos here in the center and Heiko that took scenes of the record-breaking algal bloom in Lake Erie in 2011 in the image to the right. Everything we produce with this data has to fit within the German state curricula or the teachers wouldn't have time to use it. This app is an example of what we do with the data from the ISS and features the Heiko images from the then record-breaking algal bloom in Lake Erie in 2011. Now this hyperspectral imagery is completely unheard of in German school education because it is not only complex to understand for students, but you also need special software and good computers to display it. So in this app, which is developed in the game development environment Unity, we had to reduce the software's capabilities to the required minimum, which we did mostly by reducing file sizes of the hyperspectral data and use shaders, that is this paper properties instead of actual calculations. The final task of the app for the students is to decide where to close beaches and drop, stop drinking water being extracted. 
In addition to augmented reality that brings the special view from space to Earth into the classroom, we are also trying to bring the classes into space. While the physical excursion may not be possible yet, virtual reality can bring the students into orbit and to other planets right now without the dangers, costs or extended traveling times. Mars is the most well-researched planet behind Earth, but also the big next target astronauts are preparing for with their research on the ISS, so it is logical to proceed with the virtual Mars mission. Again, real scientific data from the sensors on and around Mars has to be processed to work inside a game development environment, in this case Unreal Engine 4, and one of our main struggles is rejection in file sizes and conversion from scientific geodata files to files readable by the engine, just as it is with the AR in Unity. In conclusion, Earth observation and remote sensing are uniquely suited to get students interested for STEM because they are all of STEM, science, technology, engineering and mathematics. All of these topics are either needed to create remote sensing data or to analyze it and a large part of the STEM school curricula are teachable with remote sensing and space technologies. The ISS's largest Earth observation satellite is and was home to a multitude of sensors, few of which have their data made available online for free. Student smartphones substitute for school IT infrastructure but do not have the capabilities for GIS functions. Advantages and disadvantages of desktop computers can be exploited or have to be worked around, which works well in AR. Augmented reality apps enhance static printable worksheets with animated content and inexpensive effective digital experiments in Earth observation, but all remote sensing data has to be processed and visualized beforehand, as the smartphones are not yet capable of handling that kind of data and software and have limitations on energy usage. Teaching of the use of complex remote sensing data is possible and gives the students purpose and even a fun experience for their normally theory-loaded STEM lessons. Virtual reality can be used for classroom excursions even beyond Earth. Real data can be used for a realistic environment with some constraints, but there are possibilities for interactive excursions. And this is our website where the highlight videos and school material are published. Thank you for attending my sessions and I look forward to your questions. Hello, I'm Nao Hirosato from JAMS, Japan Manned Space Systems Corporation. Thank you for joining this session. I would like to introduce JAMS commercial service Kirara in space manufacturing using ISS. Kirara means shiny in Japanese. Please see our introduction video first. We have partners to realize killer service. Confocal Science has long experience of protein crystallization in space since Space Shuttle Space Application Services, who is European company, provide their ice cubes service with their own facility in ISS. JAMS is an integrator of Kilara. So Kilara service is provided with worldwide team. In December 5th last year, our first demonstration model of Kilara was launched to ISS by SpaceX. In our first demonstration, several companies, universities and institutions joined from Europe as well as Japan. University of Tokyo succeeded fast cellulose synthesis by the enzyme under the microgravity environment of space for the first time in the world. With the success of our first mission, we have called for users of killer service. We already reserved two flights and now preparing for SpaceX 21. We are also looking for new application of our service. You can think there are two materials are mixed in space and form something new one under conditions of no settling and no convection flow. New idea of clear utilization is very welcome for us. We also agreed support of COVID-19 consortium initiated by InnoStudio. 
One of our goals is implementation of an integrated Earth space drug development platform. This is an important approach to move to their commercialization. It would be great if Kirara could contribute to drug discovery to solve the worldwide big problems. For more information, please visit at our website. Thank you for your attention. All right, very good. Excellent presentations. Um, so, seeing some good questions coming in on the Q&A tool. Please don't hesitate to submit some additional questions there as we get going. Our panelists are all uh, online and getting ready to come on screen. And um, the Q&A tool is down the bottom of your screen down there. Just click on that and submit your question that way. And with that, I will turn it over to our session chair, Alan DeLuna. Alan, take it away. Thank you, Jim. We had a, a number of very interesting things there. Some of them are related to each other, and we'll talk about that as we go forward. But first, I'd like to introduce our panel. We've got uh, Sandeep Batula from Quelvillian Technologies Private Limited in India, Pierre Christian and Stimmy from Air Force Defense and Space in Germany, Lauren Church from King's College in London, United Kingdom, Hamda Al Shari from UAE Space Agency, United Arab Emirates, Claudia Lindner from Ruhr University Bochum in Germany, and Sarahi Naharo Sato from JAMS in Japan. So thank all of y'all for being on today. Uh, we appreciate your, your attention. The, the first question I'd like to do is I'd like to address it to Lauren and Claudia both. So the, the, you both talked about access to science data and you talked about difficulties in accessing the scientific data. Would you expand that a little bit and tell us what you think we need to do to better make the science data available and interesting to folks in addition to what you're doing in your projects. So first, Lauren, please. Okay, so one of the, the biggest things is making sure that everyone is able to access that data. So any outputs that you generate, making sure that the accessibility is checked, um, because I, I believe that outreach is impossible unless everyone has, has access to the materials that you produce. So making sure that any Images are provided with alternative text. Any audio files uh, have transcripts available. Um, so it's a it's making sure that anything that that you use can be used by everyone. Claudia. Uh, yes, there are two things in that regard. Sometimes um, there are, for example, news articles or things you put, uh, the NASA puts on its website, and you don't really know how did they come to that image, what kind of remote sensing techniques did they use for this. So it would be uh, very beneficial for us and for our students um, if the way how you got to a specific image, especially if it's false color, if it's infrared, um, yeah, was presented as well. And then there's the main issue we have is that, uh, <clears throat> sorry, uh, that the projects, the images come from are either private or from uh, a different country. And here I hope for the international community to help us out because, uh, for example, Russian data is basically non-existent for us because you can only uh, access it if you speak Russian, um, stuff like that. And Japanese as well. We haven't really been able to get Japanese data um, for our purposes. So yeah, these two things we need to know how the, the good images are made and we need more access to private or international data, kind of. Thank you, Claudia. Sandeep, um, what are the performance characteristics of your technology? More specifically, how does it perform better than the existing technology that we're using today in the ISS to understand the uh, atmospheric conditions? Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, in ISS, currently it is employing ANITA, which is uh, stands for Analyzing Interferometer for Ambient Air. And the lessons learned from ANITA 1 is nothing but 
uh, Anita actually employing uh, the FTR based spectrometer, which is optomechanical and are very prone to the vibrations. So it requires some additional mounting capabilities, which increases the cost. And coming to uh, the calibration, they are using uh, robust calibration techniques uh, using multivariate analysis. So whenever we have a whenever we increase the robustness uh, with the cost of decreasing the measurement quality. And besides, uh, the Anita can actually measure the air pollutants inside the International Space Station right uh, where it is located. So it is important to uh, locate other gases. Uh, so it requires some network of elements. So let us say uh, if we are employing some miniaturized sensors, so we can install in uh, each and every module that uh, the ISS has, like ESDS, Nikibo, and ESA. So uh, in that pattern, we can also identify the source of the air pollution. And obviously, NASA is also looking for the miniaturized uh, kind of a things because in, for the future missions, it is very important for uh, the space. Uh, it is very important to have uh, the space constraints. So a lot of missions is going to be launched in the coming years. So we need a miniaturized device in order to fulfill the requirements. Thank you, Sanjeev. Uh, another question for Lauren. Lauren. There's lots of interest in the, the waxworm investigation. Um, how did the waxworms react to microgravity? Were you able to test them without the warm floating? Uh, how did they act differently in microgravity than they did on Earth? Okay, so uh, this is a kind of part of the scientific process. We didn't uh, get the re results that we were expecting through this experiment. Um, we found that the uh, polythene degradation actually decreased in the microgravity environment. Uh, looking back on that, we're thinking that that might potentially be to do with the microgravity environment combined with the lack of purchase on the polythene surface by the worms. So they were not able to move as freely as they were on Earth. Um, and it could also be to do with the uh, stressful environment involved in launch and uh, in space itself. Um, but looking forward, this was part of a uh, kind of potential set of ongoing experiments into the optimization of these conditions. Um, and therefore, uh, we're looking to the future to, to look to optimize those further. Okay, thank you, Lauren. Pierre Christian, regarding the Baltimore uh, would you yes, talk, indeed. Would you talk? Yes, indeed. It's an exciting platform. Um, would you talk a little bit about uh, data communications? Uh, you talked, uh, your big uh, presentation had a little bit in it about the laser communication system that you're putting on, the, the first one for the ISS. Tell us a little bit of how you use that versus how you might use uh, the normal downlink and uplink from the ISS. Right. Uh, thank you for the question. Indeed, the, um, we expect in the near future more data intensive uh, use cases. And that is why in the an, in an next evolution of the platform, we intend to uh, install our own laser communication device. Uh, we're working on that in cooperation with the uh, German Aerospace Center. And uh, that device is then uh, uh, direct to earth uh, laser com, uh, uh, device that will enhance the downlink capability independently from the currently uh, used um, ISS link, which we have to share with other users on the European Columbus module. So the capability um, is, has been estimated uh, in a conservative way to become uh, in the order of two terabytes per day. Uh, with that device um, and that uh, builds upon uh, um, an optical ground station network of at least uh, eight stations that would have to be distributed uh, over the uh, over the ground path of ISS uh, and we hope that within the next two or three years we can be more concrete on that because we are currently working on on that evolutionary step for for the Bartolomeo platform. And a little follow-up while you're still on um, you started to talk about it a bit. I, I don't think I caught the exact uh, specification that you gave. How much of the ground track of the ISS will you cover with your laser communications in the beginning and how long will it take you to be able to cover the entire ground track of the ISS with laser communications? 
Yeah, we're speaking today, we're speaking with um, several uh, potential providers of an optical ground segment. So the, the true bottleneck here is really the, uh, uh, the development of an optical ground segment. The, the flight segment is under control and we work on having it launched uh, in the course of next year. Um, and that will, will be commissioned and, and use first, first a DLR, German Aerospace Center, ground stations uh, of the Institute of, for Communication and Navigation, just for, for testing and commissioning purposes. And then uh, we are hoping, and this is also a commercial question, uh, question really, we are hoping and we are working with uh, at least two other providers, potential providers of optical ground segments. And if we, we are ramping up the capacity, um, of course, first you have to start with some, maybe two or three stations. And, and, but our desire is to have a segment of, of eight or more stations, because that would give us obviously that, that capacity. And where those stations are, we don't, we don't really care. We need good weather. Uh, and that has been, by the way, has been also considered in our, our calculations where, um, uh, it, there was a weather model, a conservative weather model involved. So uh, with that, with those eight stations positioned well over the, over the globe, uh, we'll have the two terabyte uh, cap uh, capability. So that's, that's where we are today. We are still building that capability. Thank you, Karakul. Hamda, talking about the UAE project. Do you have any approved plans to uh, continue the scientific program on board the ISS after completion of the test in orbit program. What comes after test in orbit for the ISS? Yes, thank you, um, Adam, for your question. So actually in terms of uh, ISS experiments program, it's one of uh, the recurrent programs supported by the UAE Space Agency. So it's going to be uh, conducted in a regular basis. And once we are done with test in orbit, uh, there will be, of course, more opportunities uh, as part of uh, the agency's plan to engage more students and more researchers into um, ISS programs. Uh, we're actually also part of uh, the Kibo ABC, and uh, we participated in uh, Kibo RPC, Kibo Robot Programming Challenge Initiative that was uh, conducted by JAXA. So it's one of uh, the sustainable initiatives um, uh, that we uh, make sure to engage. And um, I'm sure that some of you already uh, hear the exciting news about the newly signed agreement between the UAE, uh, or Mohammed Barashid Space Center and NASA about uh, training uh, the UAE astronauts for potential ISS missions, including spacewalks. Uh, so yeah, this is uh, something that uh, we'll continue uh, to take part in. Thank you, Hamda. Your hero, your turn. Asking about. Uh, yes, I'm here. <laughs> today. Uh, the Kira project is a JAMS project, but also JAXA has the PCG project. What's the difference or the correlation between the JAMS Kira and the JAXA PCG? Yeah. Actually, the Confocal Science, who joined in Kilara mission, support, also supports JAXA for PCG. So basic technique is the same, but the, our Kilara is a purely commercial one. And we are working with European companies. And because this is a commercial one, uh, for example, any, uh, any missions, not only proteins, for other things like cellular synthesis can join in our service. So that is, uh, I think, uh, advantage in commercial. And of course, COVID-19 consortium is one of them. We are working with the Hungarian company uh, for that. That is also different uh, from, uh, yeah, something new in Kilara as commercial services. So co content, uh, key technology is same, but the application is a little bit different because that is, Kilara is really commercial one. All right, somewhat uh, similar to maybe some of the work that NASA is doing on their own in the space station and the uh, cases ISS National Lab is doing for commercial and maybe 
similar processes, but for different different customers and different uh, end results. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Okay, Sandeep, a little more about your uh, air monitoring system. Have you gone in and compared the results of what you expect to have over the Russian ones obtained on the Russia side of the ISS? And what's the difference in the methods between what you're going to be doing and what the Russians have in their system? Yes, uh, currently we are doing everything in the simulations, uh, in the numerical. Actually, the journey that we started uh, st uh, started in four months, not even greater than, maybe six months. So before uh, six months, we were thinking in the direction of using the what other companies are actually doing, like using electrochemical basis sensors. But then we found a lot of flaws in those kind of sensors. Uh, the one of the flaw is nothing but selectivity issue. So we can only find out the levels or the concentration levels, but we're not able to find out uh, the uh, specificity of the uh, molecules. So uh, we also uh, done a some literature survey, survey on ANITA and the Russian space agencies. They're using GCMS and FTR based technologies. And we are completely going for the nanophotonics, uh, which is an emerging technology uh, that employs the light matter interactions. So not only the size will, not only the size can reduce it, it can also be uh, improved the sensitivity. The one thing, uh, the major advantage of our technology is we are employing uh, micro ring resonators. So in normal FTR and GCMS, uh, we require path lengths. So the greater the path lengths is, uh, the better uh, the, the better the sensitivity that we can find the molecules. So likewise, uh, we need to reduce that size. So let us say if you reduce the path length, then uh, the measurement quality will reduce us. But that is not the case with our technology because the micro resonators uh, enhances uh, the light matter interactions because uh, it, is, it is a kind of an optical modulation. So it increases the length of interaction with the molecules uh, like what Anita as well as the GCMS techniques are employing. All right, Sandeep, thank you very much. Uh, Pierre Christian. Uh, yes. We have a question from the audience. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the upcoming Earth observation experiments on Bartholomew? Yes, um, thank you for that question. Indeed, um, Bartholomew is a, is a good platform for Earth remote sensing uh, because we designed it to be so. We're at the front porch of the, uh, of the ISS. We're looking in RAM direction. So you have a beautiful, very beautiful view um, on the planet Earth. Of course, we are uh, facing also the challenges that everybody on ISS is facing regarding pointing accuracy and uh, attitude knowledge, but there are ways to overcome it and not all instruments need exact pointing. So we are focusing on those missions which can live with, the, uh, with a relatively coarse platform ISS and uh, the, the missions which are under discussion, so I cannot really reveal all the details of that, uh, respecting also the privacy of the data of our potential customers. But um, we are looking primarily at, at a number of missions that deal with climate monitoring and climate change uh, observation, and also other uh, more exotic types of uh, Earth remote sensing all civilian, of course, but all, and most of them for the benefit of mankind and some of them for uh, really scientific purposes. We are um, in, in touch with a number of um, universities and companies over here in Europe. Um, they all look uh, at, um, at really beneficial cases like CO2 monitoring and climate change uh, predictions. Uh, also wildfires are a topic. Um, we have others um, uh, in the U.S. who um, would like to produce more data uh, for, uh, to get a more global view on, on change processes, also for, from an from a even political angle, not just a pure scientific or uh, just a, a space observation angle. Um, and then we have also a number of uh, technology demonstrators um, who just want to uh, verify that their measurement principle uh, is working or even then building on top of that uh, we are speaking about uh, with some who, who have their observation technology at hand they know that it works but they want to test their business model behind because they, they try to produce on a, on a low cost basis 
uh, data and sell them uh, to the to the to the market. So, in fact, this is not only a technology uh, demonstration platform; it's then also a business demonstration platform, which is something we we were desiring for a long time uh, to uh, to give to the space environment, just to speed up uh, the growth of the space economy based on ISS. All right, thank you for a very complete answer. I didn't realize it was that that extensive, actually. Uh, Lauren, still lots of interest in your your wax worms, and um, you said you your results were not what you expected. Uh, so talk us to us a little bit more. Give us a minute or so about how your your worms uh, reacted in uh, in things such as increased rate of uh, polyethylene digestion. Um, did you find them eating things that you did not expect them to eat? Or did they not have that opportunity? You know, if you release these things into a environment, what are the unintended consequences? So about a minute on that, please. Okay, so um, the way that we set up our experiment is we had the worms contained inside a polyethylene pocket, which was heat sealed along all of the edges. Uh, and then we placed that pocket inside a tissue culture flask to keep everything contained um, because we uh, looked at the, the fact that they could eat polyethylene plastic and decided that we didn't want to be the people who released these worms free onto the ISS. Um, so we made sure that they weren't able to, to escape at all or eat their way out of the tissue culture flask that we placed them in. Um, so actually we think that, that part of the issue is that this envelope was effectively two dimensional. So we had two sheets of polyethylene plastic that we heat sealed along all of the edges. Um, now in the microgravity environment, we think that that might have limited their movement. Um, so we found that they weren't eating the plastic the way that they did on earth. Um, I think we, we saw a few kind of holes in the corners, uh, but not nearly as much as we saw in our, in our set of experiments on earth. Um, so, uh, that could be a potential avenue for, for future investigation. We can change the setup of this experiment uh, and potentially give them a surface that they might be able to get more traction on so that they can move in a more natural way. Um, but for, for now, I mean, looking at the, the results and the images that we got back from the ISS, uh, this is uh, something that actually sending them to space actually decreases the, the rate of the uh, polythene breakdown by these worms. Um, so we also learned a lot in our stability experiments about the effect of temperature on these worms. Um, so they are inactive at lower temperatures. And if uh, you refrigerate them as we did prior to the launch, um, their levels of activity go right down. Um, and what we want to look at again in the future is how this might affect their metabolism. So we think that potentially if they are then reheated and, and effectively awoken from this cooling, um, then we think that it might have had a knock-on effect on the uh, metabolism of the polythene. Thank you, Lauren. All right, I've just been told I'm gonna to get the hook in, three, in seven minutes. Let's do some, some lightning round activities. Uh, this question is from another one of our chairman in the sessions, Prasad. Good morning, Prasad. Uh, this is for Hamda. Um, are there any special considerations for the palm tree growth study? And do you think some other edible might be better to study than the palm tree? Uh, this is an interesting question. So uh, basically the, the major focus of uh, this investigation was to study germination of the seeds. Uh, rather than um, um, studying the eatable um, version of the date. That's why we were, um, uh, the, the experiment was carried out in a way uh, studying the germination of the seeds um, um, on board the station for a specific period of time to um, monitor what's, what are the best conditions for growing uh, palm tree um, seeds in space, uh, as well as storing uh, seeds, different um, species of seeds um, in microgravity in environment for a particular period of time. And this analysis then, sorry, these seeds then were uh, returned back uh, to the ground to be, uh, uh, to carry out some characterization. Um, uh, in special labs uh, we have at the Agriculture and uh, Food Department at uh, University of United Arab Emirates. So um, uh, some um, uh, physical and chemical characterization 
uh, will be studied for uh, these sample tissues. And of course, uh, more analysis and results will be, um, uh, uh, will be got from this analysis. Thank you, Amira. Claudia, um, will you be trying to do any analysis for the newer EHDC system or other live video feeds from the ISS? Uh, definitely, we are going to to use what we can get, what we can get our hands on, um, and uh, we'd be delighted to have more videos again to process and uh, maybe with better quality than the HDF before. Um, so we'll we'll just implement into our apps and um, digital modules everything <laughs> that looks on Earth from the ISS. Thank you very much. Um, for, uh, let's see here, which one do I want to go to? Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Now, Hero, on your... Uh, uh, yes? On, on your, uh, your commercial utilization of ISS, are you limiting that to the uh, Japanese uh, segment, or are you also going to be using the American segment or the Russian segment or the Columbus module for some of your commercial activities? Uh, actually, uh, my partner is a space application service European company, and Kirara Cube, our equipment is located in Columbus module, not Jam ja Japanese module. So it already work with uh, European module now. So, uh, as if we, you know, we are working with space application service, but of course through commercial uh, activities that we are looking for to have. Uh, new partners in US module or even upcoming action space module. That is also a good candidate for our future commercial service. All right, thank you. One more for Bartolomeo. Um, who will be in charge of operating and managing the, the payloads through the Bartolomeo? Airbus, ESA, uh, DLR? Uh, good question. We have a corporation, so Bartolomeo is a, is a public uh, private partnership with, with ESA and also the ISS National Lab. And uh, in the operations uh, part, we have the Bartolomeo uh, um, Control Center that is responsible for operating the Bartolomeo platform and also monitoring uh, the Bartolomeo payloads. We do that in close cooperation with the Columbus uh, uh, Control Center because of the uh, architectural setup of the of the Columbus module. There is some some commands that you can only give uh, uh, to the platform from from the Columbus control center. That's also a safety feature, if you will. So the XCMU commands, those are discrete commands uh, to uh, switch on and switch off some of the payloads and the platform itself. Those are handled by the by the Columbus control center. And of course, the ISS planning uh, tasks and everything that is that, that, that is included there is performed by our ESA colleagues. Uh, so we're focusing strictly on the on the platform side, and um, the very principle of Bartolomeo is to enable each uh, payload developer or each customer uh, to operate their payload on their own. So we have a user, what we call the user web console, that is operated in the Airbus cloud, where at the end all the telemetry and payload data end up and is secured and, set and stored. Uh, in that cloud, we operate as an application, the user web console for each individual payload, where each individual customer can uh, directly access without any further uh, ways through the control centers, uh, access uh, their, their payload. There are limits to uh, limitations to the, to the commanding uh, capability of that user web console because you need for some uh, safety criticals, you need the Columbus Control Center in the loop. But in principle, the customer at the end uh, is able to control his own and command his own payload and also do, uh, uh, do the monitoring. And we support as much as um, necessary and, and desired. Okay, well, I think that's going to have to be our last uh, question and answer. I really appreciate all you folks putting in all the effort for this, for doing both your long presentations and your excellent uh, executive summaries. So Sandeep and Pierre Christian, Lauren, Amda, Claudia, and Nahio, 
thank you very much. We appreciate you being in. I really look forward to seeing you all next year also. Jim, it's yours. Excellent. Thank you, Alan. And thank you, all the panelists. We really appreciate it. That was great. Uh, fascinating stuff and truly putting the international and international space station. So we're now going to take a little 15 minute break. Um, uh, we will be back at 1215 Universal, uh, which is 815